Okay. Okay. Um, Liz, do you think everybody's in? Yeah. All right. Go ahead and get started. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. The Public Health Advisory Board is grateful to you all for being here today for this meeting specifically about the county jail. Today, we will hear from the Correctional Health Medical and Nursing Directors, the Sheriff's Chief Deputy, the Captain and two Lieutenants, and the community group representatives, including Decarcerate Sacramento. We are very appreciative of your participation. Our goal today is to learn from individuals who work in this area, as well as to hear from community members about the county jail. We know this can be an area of discussion that may be triggering, sensitive, and emotional for many. And we hope to create a public comment period that allows for space for community members to voice their feedback, thoughts, and ideas. The top of our agenda for the first half hour or so will be focused on information sharing. We focus the information based on feedback we received from community members after our last meeting. After that, we will move into public comment. There will be a two minute time period for each public comment that we ask for the community to respect so we can hear from everyone who chose to attend the meeting today. When we get to public comment, Liz Gomez, an excellent facilitator who is helping us today, um, will um, work through the logistics. She'll talk about the logistics around how that will happen. And we are aiming to save about 30 to 45 minutes for that section. After hearing from everyone as a board, we will determine what the next steps might look like. So with that, we will get started right after a small piece of PHAB business that we need to take care of, that being the approval of the February meeting minutes. So PHAB members, are there any changes to the meeting minutes? Of approval for Steve Heath. Second. Thank you. I will now um, conduct this vote a little differently than we usually do. I'll call on each member to unmute themselves and vote aye or nay. So uh, let's see. Barbie Law. Aye. You. Tina Slee. Aye. Emmanuel. Aye. Phil. Aye. Steve. Aye. Sonal. Aye. Annie. Aye. Jofel. I'm not sure Jofel's on yet. Okay. And I vote aye. So minutes are uh, approved. And um, before we start, I'd also like to welcome two new members to PHAB's board, uh, Libby Abbott and Ashley Sterling. And uh, we'll have a, a more proper welcome next meeting. <laughs> okay, thank you. With that, I turn it back over to Liz Gomez for some remarks on our meeting procedures. Thank you, Barla. Um, I'm actually just going to pull up the agenda for everyone to see, so that way um, folks that may be um, visual learners can take a look at that. So we have here, um, as Farla mentioned, the welcome and opening remarks, then we'll move into presentations. And then we have a public comment. Okay. Okay, and then Great. what I just wanted to comment around um, the Zoom is that you can use the chat feature to chat me should there be issues with um, audio or otherwise uh, or clarifications needed, but otherwise we're going to be saving public comment for the end of the agenda. Um, where you can use the raise hand feature or raise your hand in your video i'll be scanning the videos or you can chat me and then I will let people know what the speaker queue looks like. Okay. So now to start on the topic for this meeting, we turn to Dr. Sandy Damiano, Deputy Director of Health Services for Primary Health, Health Division. 
Dr. Damiano. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sandy Damiano. And first of all, I want to thank the board for allowing this special session and special time so that we can all discuss this topic. I know many of you are very passionate about this topic, and we hope to provide a lot of information and answer questions today. Uh, before we start, I wanted to just mention a couple of items. Um, one is that the Board of Supervisors Correctional Health and Mental Health Facility Annex Workshop is scheduled on March 10th. I believe it's in the afternoon at three or four o'clock. Uh, there'll be information about the project, about the contractor and alternatives to incarceration. Uh, the last time that information was presented was in October, 2019. So for those of you who are following it, um, that would be probably good information for you. On the topic of COVID, um, which uh, I know you're very interested in, we have some very positive news today. As of the data dashboard today, uh, we have now a net new increase of COVID um, from prior week of uh, seven people. And so we have currently in custody at the main jail, there are seven COVID confirmed and five at the branch jail. So this is a really significant departure for us. Uh, people have been working extremely hard during the outbreak. Oh. So we're happy to see these positive numbers. Really? And as you know, we do a lot of testing. Uh, our number of COVID tests since March of 2020 is 12,938. So we are testing all the time. So this is a great turning point for us. We'll be watching this data very carefully. Uh, in terms of our vaccination for our staff, we've um, the nursing staff have given a total of 772 staff vaccines. Um, these do not include people um, that have gotten vaccinated offsite with their healthcare providers or any of the public health vaccination clinics. It also doesn't include any of our mental health staff who get vaccinated at UC Davis. So total of 772 vaccines for staff. For inmates, um, as of today, we've done uh, 244 inmate vaccinations. Uh, we really just recently got approval through public health to change our criteria. We are no longer limiting it to age 65 with serious medical conditions. It's now all inmates and we're gonna do it by housing. Uh, it is dependent on the vaccine supply and um, some of our logistics, but we anticipate that our numbers of inmate vaccinations will go up considerably during this next period. Uh, we also added, um, the, through the Sheriff's Department and our medical staff, we added more narrative to our um, Sheriff's COVID webpage. So it has information for families on some of the COVID protocols. So that's also on there too. So today I've brought with me um, a couple of the leaders for the adult correctional health. Uh, Pam Gandy Rosamond is our nursing director and Dr. Veer Babu is our medical director. Uh, Pam will be uh, describing our COVID protocols, uh, trying to respond to some of the Q&A that you've given us before. We've also brought our sheriff partners and colleagues. Um, so Chief uh, Santos uh, Ramos will provide the overview, but with him our Captain Todd Henry with our branch jail and uh, Lieutenant Paul Belli and Lieutenant Mark Lopez of the main jail since the captain could not be here today. So we'll go ahead and start with um, Pam's presentation. Pam? Hi everyone, my name is Pamela Gandy Roseman. I'm the nursing director for the Adult Correctional Health. And I'm gonna go over the process of medical involvement with the uh, COVID. First thing I wanna start off with is for some people who are not familiar with our jail locations, the majority of the intakes come through our main jail. And I just want to um, kind of go over a little bit of background from the beginning of COVID starting in 2020 until now. Every individual that comes into the main jail during the intake booking process is met by a medical staff member. That medical staff member asks a series of questions which are related to COVID screening 
which are very similar to the questions that were asked in the community based upon any medical location that you would go into before you could pass into the facility. We also have medical staff that will check vital signs. What is included in that vital signs is checking the temperature. This is all done before the intake process is done. After the initial vital signs in questionnaire, they are also seen again by a nurse during the intake booking process. That nurse will continue to ask additional questions. Some of those questions may be related to symptoms or any other medical condition that an individual has. If someone during the process, the initial process with the vital signs, or when they go to the nurse for the second set of questions, has any type of symptoms that could be considered COVID positive, they were not allowed into the facility. Those individuals would have to go to, um, in the past, the emergency room for evaluation. Any individual that has any type of symptoms that we are concerned with, we would not accept. We would ensure that they get additional medical screening before acceptance into the facility. Once individuals are accepted into the facility and are moved to a housing unit, again, they are um, receive medical services every single day. They are not put in general population. We will house them into what is called a quarantine area. That housing unit is with similar individuals that were admitted into the facility at the same time. Medical staff see those individuals on a daily basis to ask them any type of symptom screening, also to check for any type of temperature. While they are in this housing area, before they are released to intermingle with anyone else, we make sure that they are all tested for COVID. That means that we actually do a nasal uh, specimen collection and we run those um, results. Those are usually within 24 hours, we are able to determine if someone is COVID positive. Many individuals do, do not have symptoms. So when we tell them that they are COVID positive, there is a concern of how am I positive when I don't have symptoms? That's why we make sure that those individuals are not being dispersed through the rest of the facility because we want to ensure that someone that if they are contagious, they are not intermingling with other people because we have not had anyone who has said, I am symptomatic and that we have tested. So we test people multiple times to ensure that nobody is spreading it to someone else. So we do have many times people will ask, why am I being tested when I don't have symptoms? This is for their safety and the safety of others. Anytime someone is tested positive, that group of individuals that they are around, we will also test them again to ensure that they are not contagious and spreading it to someone else. Anyone who is in the facility that we are, we consider them medical staff. Our relationship is a patient to medical staff relationship. They have access to medical care 24 seven. There is always medical staff available to see someone if they say that they have any type of medical concerns or if they have any type of symptoms that they feel may be COVID related. So we always have medical staff available. We do test people continuously. And so many people, um, we're working on providing the continuing education to understand why we test them. It's not based upon symptoms, it's based upon someone is positive. So again, we just wanna make sure that 
that person does not have any symptoms or they could be spreading it to someone else. We also have um, education that we are providing to the inmates. They can ask questions. We have, uh, we make sure that our staff are practicing um, good um, precautions such as we're making sure that medical staff are always masked. We're making sure that if they are in an area where that is under isolation or quarantine, we are making sure that we're wearing gloves, we have our masks, um, we have disposable gowns that we're using so that we are not transmitting anything from one patient to another. So that's very important. And um, I'm trying to kind of do a highlight of everything of questions that you might have. Um, all patients have access to medical staff to ask them any questions. We're also ensuring that if someone tests positive, we will provide them a copy of their test results so they actually have that piece of documentation and they can use that at any other time or give that information to someone else. And I know I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to kind of give an overview, um, but I'm also receptive to any questions later on. Thank you. I see Dr. Babu, you are also on the agenda. Um, so um, is there anything else you wanted to add? I'm gonna unmute you if, because uh, it's you can't do it on your own <laughs> the way the Zoom is set up. The, you know, the uh, main thing I want to add was, I mean, we are uh, like compared to the community, we are doing a lot of testing. So there's no under undercounting uh, for us. And some of them are repeat positives who stay positives for a month or two sometimes. And anybody who has got any kind of symptoms, if we are, we are not able to take care of them here, we always send them to the closest hospital via ambulance. I mean, we probably have done it about 15 times so far. And, uh, you know, that's been the number of hospitalization and zero deaths. And uh, so the, if any, any symptoms develops related to COVID and they get uh, seen right away by a nurse, and if there is a physician or a, a nurse practitioner, they see them. If not, if it's after hours, they get sent to the emergency room. So. Thank you. All right. Um, so I will pass it over Farla. Let me unmute you. Um, so <clears throat> thank yep. you. Mm -hmm. So we do have a couple of minutes for some questions from the board members. We usually try and allow that. And since we do have time, I would like uh, to ask a question. Has there been any, any problem with timelines and treatment uh, for people? Do we have the resources to respond um, to people with symptoms and um, in, in a very timely way? So I, I want to answer that one. I mean, we are always, uh, uh, I mean, understaffed with physicians and nurses. And so, I mean, but but whenever somebody's having symptoms, they get seen promptly. I mean, they get their vital signs checked, they get triaged by the nurse. And if they've like, you know, if they need to go to the hospital, uh, they go to the hospital. I mean, uh, so yes, we are understaffed to take care of, uh, you know, like, uh, multiple patients with multiple problems, but whenever there's an acute episode, I mean, if uh, something is like an emergency, I think uh, we have enough staffing to take care of that particular patient. Thank, Thank you. you. So Farla, there's a couple folks that have messaged me. Um, so I will just uh, verbalize, why don't we take a total of three questions? I'll take one more from a board member and then a community member did submit a question as well. Um, so we have a question from one of our board members that's asking, these protocols sound robust and we went several months with few cases. Has there been a root cause analysis of the cause of the outbreak and the difficulty in containing it? So I think this is directed to Pamela, Dr. Babu or um, Sandy. Okay, I, this is Sandy. I'm not sure who, who's going to answer. So we did uh, look extensively at this. It required a lot of contact tracing. 
um, that happened. Um, I have spoken before that jails are more prone to outbreaks than other facilities in terms of congregate care, uh, which our health officer who's also on the line can, can speak to that. Um, as noted before, we discovered the outbreak during some transports of inmates and later tested some, and then we knew that we had outbreak happening at both jails. Um, from there, it was very hard to determine because the um, initiation of the COVID into the jails could occur through multiple sources. We are a high volume facility, uh, so we have numbers, uh, numbers of people being booked daily, as well as we have a lot of different staff, visitors, et cetera. So I don't know that we've uh, narrowed it down to one source. Um, it could have been multiple. And so our plan of attack and a mitigation was on all facets and it took quite a while. Um, but you're also welcome to ask Dr. Kasiris on the call. We met with her uh, and we continue to meet with her every week <laughs> on our situation. So thank you. Dr. K, anything you wanna add? Yeah, so I agree with uh, what Dr. Damiano has said, um, that one, uh, congregate settings are, one, it's very difficult to control, and also sometimes it is difficult to determine where it all started, uh, because as uh, she pointed out, the source of entry could be uh, multiple, the fact that you have inmates be um, coming in, they are also moving from one, uh, facility to another, as well as uh, from one pod to another. So, and then you also have staff who are coming in, uh, who, if they are, you know, asymptomatic, could also be the the ones that started off. Um, also, it's very difficult in congregate settings to control outbreaks. Um, and if you actually look look uh, at all the the facilities that have had outbreaks. It's, it, you usually have a, a large number. So it's, I, I think we were fortunate that um, Sacramento County was spared for as long as it was. And also fortunate in the fact that uh, we got the outbreak right around the time that uh, we started vaccinating. So that's one of the decisions that we made is to um, be able to make the vaccine available to all of the inmates. Great. Thanks, Dr. K. Um, I'm actually going to hold, um, well, let's see, this one looks like it was the next question in line and it may be a, a, a shorter one, but then we want to transition to the sheriff so that way we can make sure that we leave ample time for public comment. Um, so this is a question for, um, we have, walk, can you please walk me through the process or can you walk me through the process for access to a medical pro professional from the perspective of the inmate? Pam, did you want to take that one? Sure, I'll take that one. So there is, um, so the perspective from an inmate is that they have, um, they can submit what's called a health service request um, to be seen by medical. They also can notify a custody officer if they need to see medical. Um, so there's multiple ways to request to be seen and since anyone that is on the isolation or quarantine areas is seen daily by medical staff for symptom checks, they have that opportunity to request for additional services. And we have pill call nurses that go out and see the majority of our patients in the facility. So they also can request to be seen during that time. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, Farlow, if it's okay with you, we'll, we'll go ahead and transition to the next item on the agenda. Alrighty. Um, so I am just going to ask you all to unmute. Um, so we have Todd, um, thank you. And we have a couple other folks. I'm trying to find you here on the screen. <laughs> it can be a little tough sometimes. Um, and Paul. So we have Todd, Paul, and um, Santos. I don't see Santos on here. Um, okay, oh, there we go. All right, Santos, can you hear me? I can. Great. Um, okay, so Todd, Paul, and Santos, um, you're... 
Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Santos Ramos. I'm the chief deputy in charge of correctional services for the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office. Because of the wide variety of individuals and, and backgrounds on this particular call, I wanted to give a snapshot overview of our correctional system and give a little bit of understanding of what our population looks like, what it's looked like over the past couple of years, and what drives that population. Um, so we currently operate two correctional facilities within the County of Sacramento, the Sacramento County Main Jail downtown and the Rio Casumnes Correctional Center down in South Elk Grove. The main jail acts as our intake facility for new bookings. It's also where we house the majority of our pretrial inmates. A pretrial inmate is considered somebody who's going through the court system uh, to determine whether or not um, they will remain in custody or be released. At the Rio Casumnes Correctional Center, the majority of our population down there is our sentenced pop population. Now, because of the nature of our triple C and the, um, uh, the volume of intakes at the main jail, our triple C also acts as a relief valve for our population at the main jail. And so we do have a number of pretrial inmates that are uh, periodically moved down to our triple C because of bed space. So that gives you kind of an overview of the, the differences between the two facilities. They are very different in their physical plant makeup. Uh, the main jail is a, a, a tower um, building that's downtown and Rio Casimnes Correctional Center is spread out with a number of different facilities, um, uh, maximum and medium security facilities, some dorm housing as well. And so they're, they're very different in the way that they operate. Um, and any pretrial inmates that we have at RCCC, depending on the status of where they are in the court process, we may need to and often transfer inmates uh, via bus on a daily basis to the downtown courts so that they can uh, you know, go through their court process. So that gives you kind of a snapshot of the two facilities. Um, to give you a snapshot of our population, and I'll go back to 2019. So between January 2019 and December 2019, before the pandemic, our average daily population was 3,795 3, inmates. That's between both facilities. Looking, you know, the pandemic kind of hit us around uh, March. And so from March 2020, um, to the present, uh, about 11 and a half months, the average daily population dropped down by about 600 inmates. And so over this uh, past year, um, our average daily population has dropped down to 3,124. The main jail being our main intake facility, um, prior to COVID, between January and December of 2019, our average monthly intake. So that's the number of individuals that are getting booked into custody at the main jail was about 3,384. On a daily basis, that was about on average 112 inmates. So those are the inmates that are getting, uh, that are fresh arrests getting brought into the facility. When the pandemic hit, that number started to drop. Um, so in April of 2020, we saw a sharp drop of, um, you know, about a thousand inmates per month. So between March of 2020 and uh, the end of February 2021, our average uh, intakes at the main jail went down to 2,115. And so our average daily bookings went down to 70. Now those are intakes. And so our population is driven by a number of different factors. One of those factors obviously is the number of inmates that are getting booked into our facility on a daily basis. Not every one of those inmates, as you know, stays in our custody. There are, are a variety of systems in place to determine whether or not that uh, individual is fit for release. So we have a very robust site and release program where, uh, generally speaking, low-level misdemeanor offenders are cited, uh, given a court date, and released. 
um, a number of other inmates, uh, you know, if they're arrested for, let's say, public intoxication. After their uh, sobering period, then they're released uh, back out uh, into the public. So there are a number of factors that drive um, our intakes and who is going to stay within our facilities. So to give you a kind of a contrast of those intakes versus the amount of people that we dress in and keep in our facility. So for example, that January to December 2019, um, average intakes of 3,384. Of those, we dressed in during that same time period an average of 1,938. So about half of the inmates in 2019 that got booked into custody actually stayed with us. And so they get dressed in and then housed up in the facility. After that, um, there are a number of ways that they can get released. So during their uh, you know, uh, initial court process, the court could release them. Um, they could bond out. So not all of those inmates that are getting dressed in are staying with us for a long period of time. Um, the contrast uh, post-COVID, so our intakes, like I mentioned, uh, had dropped down to 2,115, uh, a daily average of 70. So the number of people that we were dressing in, again, cut down by 50% we were averaging uh, 1,040 inmates that would, we would actually dress in. So about 35 inmates per day would stay in our custody at least for uh, a day or two. So that gives you kind of a snapshot of what our population looks like now, what it looked like prior to COVID. Um, we have seen, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic and ha as time has progressed, we've seen an uptick in our population, and there's a number of factors that go into that. Initially, when the uh, pandemic first hit, as with everything, everyone was taking uh, many, many more precautions. So the proactivity level of law enforcement officers out on the street, you know, rightfully so, they weren't contacting as many people. Um, as time has gone by, those proactive contacts and our calls for service have gone up. So law enforcement in general are now contacting more people, which obviously is gonna result in you know, potential, the potential for more arrests. But there's a couple things that are in place uh, and have been in place since the beginning of the pandemic that have driven our population uh, as well. Um, from the, from the get-go, there were, uh, I wanna say three or four different court orders that allowed us to release um, uh, certain types and categories of offenders back out into custody, or I'm sorry, back out into the public, um, there was $0 bail. And so individuals would get arrested and because of $0 bail, then uh, they would get processed through the intake process and then released out the doors. So there, like I said, there's a number of different factors that go into um, what drives our population in custody. One of those things, and a just challenge wanted to us. give you a, this is Liz, just wanted to give you a quick time check. We just have a minute or two left. Okay. Um, so any last thoughts? And if your colleagues, Todd or Paul also, um, I know you, we have them on the line too. So just letting you know. Yeah, so just real quick. Um, one of the things that's affecting our population right now is the California Department of Corrections and their very strict intake uh, policies. Those, they have shut down and opened up intake uh, time and time again during the pandemic. As of today, we have 593 inmates in our custody who are awaiting transfer to uh, state prison. So that gives you an idea of if CDCR were to open the floodgates, we would be able to release uh, 593 people back into our custody. So that's a snapshot of our, our two facilities, our populations. And just to touch on, we've been working since the beginning of this pandemic with correctional health. Uh, public health and the court monitors for the consent decree on developing and maintaining uh, effective COVID uh, procedures and protocols with regards to our custody staff as well. So uh, my other staff members, obviously, we're all here uh, and available for questions. Great. Thanks, Santos. Um, so Todd and Paul, we are about at time here in regards to the presentations. Are there any kind of concluding remarks you all want to share? Uh, this is Paul Bell. I, I, I don't have any additional remarks. I think the chief uh, summed it up very well. I concur. 
All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so we'll go ahead and transition to Decarcerate, um, who will also provide an update. So we have Matthew. So Matthew, I'll go ahead and unmute you. And then we have Jael. I'm gonna try to find you, here we go. Um, Jael, can you, yeah. And am I saying your name correctly? JL. JL, thank you. Okay, so mm -hmm. Matthew, you are good to go. Thank you. Um, I have just a quick question. Would it be possible for me to share my screen just so I can share my audio um, later in the presentation? Um, that shouldn't be a problem. Let me just first spotlight you since both of you have your um, video. So that way we have it at spotlight. Um, so why don't you start off and then let me see uh, what's possible with the Zoom controls. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you so much um, for having us here today for holding this meeting. Um, and this very important meeting. My name is Matthew and I'm a community member um, and um, engaged with and part of Decarcerate Sacramento. Um, and, um, and we're going to be talking about um, sort of a, a, a different perspective than what has been presented here today um, to try to um, give you all an understanding of what the experience is really like for people in the jail right now. Um, I also want to just pass it over to um, JL to introduce herself. Hi, my name is JL. Um, I'm a proud member of Decarcerate Sacramento. I wanna thank everyone for being here today. And um, I assume that we all essentially want to come to an understanding. Uh, let me start off by saying, in order to fully grasp what we are saying here today, you have to open your hearts to the fact that these women and men inmates that are living under these inhumane conditions are human beings and could be your husband, wife, son, daughter, best friend, et cetera. Can anyone honestly say that it that they would be okay if their loved one was in a place that conditions were not so livable? Um, if, if I'm assuming right, then the answer is no, and you wouldn't be okay with this. For example, um, I have a loved one in the Sac County Jail, and he has been there almost two years, and his pretrial status, and hasn't been, he's been to court two times for his case. Um, he has a low immune system and has pre-existing mental health issues and has been tested for COVID, but has yet to see his results. Could you imagine how scary that is for not only me and my family, but for him? There are so many inmates who are pre-trial and have COVID symptoms, but doesn't know their status or the ones who um, receive their results, but can't social distance because there are so many people in the pods. How can they even prevent the spread when they're not supplied with the proper tools to do so? When there are cleaning supplies um, available, it's inmate pot workers that are the ones who are using them. They don't have any training on how to clean properly or how to prevent the spread of COVID or any other disease. Um, if we leave here today with anything that I've said, please let it be the fact that these inmates need the compassion we would show our own loved ones in situations like this. Let there be, let their jail term not be a death sentence due to lack of proper care. I sincerely hope that after today's meeting, we leave here with a better understanding of each other and gain the knowledge we need on how important it is to keep the jail safe and clean for not only inmates, but the surrounding community, because the staff in the jails, they're leaving out every day going home to their family and friends. Thank you. Thank you, JL, um, for sharing your experience with us. Um, and I want to just share very briefly, um, Decarcerate Sacramento is a grassroots coalition um, with three goals um, in Sacramento. Uh, number one is to reduce the jail population um, in Sacramento County. Number two is to stop all jail expansions, further jail expansions in Sacramento County or annexes or um, um, yes, um, other types of, of expansions. And number three is to reinvest um, in community-based care uh, and alternatives to incarceration. Um, we are presenting you, uh, presenting to you here on behalf of Decarcerate's Inside Outside um, organizing team. And what we do is we, we build a supportive network for people inside of um, Sacramento County's jails. Um, and um, today I'll be sharing a little bit, uh, a few more, um, um, a little bit more information about um, what's going on inside the jails. And then um, 
if that's all right with you all, I'm going to share a few brief recordings um, from people who um, uh, are inside Sacramento County Jail so that they can share some of the things that they're experiencing. Um, so by, by the numbers, um, the outcomes uh, within the jail are quite staggering. Um, and I think it's important that we zoom out for a second. Um, so within the last 10 years in Sacramento County, there's been 42 in custody deaths. Um, there's been 23 attempted suicides in 2020 alone. Um, 30, 30, and then when we talk about racial disparity in Sacramento County and within our jails, 37% um, of uh, people who are incarcerated in Sacramento County are black, although the county's general population is only 11% black. 70% of the um, of the population of people incarcerated are actually pretrial, um, have not been found guilty of a crime. Um, and the current data from the county shows that almost 60% of the people in the jail are in need of mental health support. There is one active federal consent decree mandating that a uh, jail mandating a jail population reduction and significantly improving jail conditions. Um, we do know also from the prison policy initiative that one jail stay uh, means that a person is seven times more likely to be unhoused. Um, and uh, children of, of people who have been or are being caged are six times more likely to be caged themselves. So with some of those um, broader statistics um, and information, um, I'm going to share um, a testimony um, for five minutes um, from two folks that are inside of um, Sacramento County Jail at this at this time. Um, just need to share my audio. Right. Thank you all for listening for your patience here. So this next testimony is from somebody who is at uh, RCCC and who is currently still a pre uh, on pretrial detention. Well, the first thing is, everything that they've been telling to the public is a lie. They're, they're not giving us any clean, cleaning supplies in reference to bleach or, you know, they, they give us, you know, the regular um, disinfectant and that sort of thing. But we need bleach, we need, we need, we need, we need real disinfectant. Um, we're, we're being exposed to the virus. I don't know how it's getting in Matthew, here. Matthew, can you increase the volume? Exposed to it because if not only are we exposed to it, but every time somebody tests it positive, there's it's, it's nothing, it's nothing changes with the doctor's status. It's, it's always a constant. I'm going to try. Self cough. It's a constant. Somebody shivering or vomiting. Can you hear it? Throwing up or shaking or, you know, there's no social distancing and there's. There's, 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 there's no, there's, 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 there's no plan in place to, to prevent it, pretty much. You know, we're, we're just in a, a, a melting pot, and it seems like they're not going to do anything about it until somebody dies. Mm. You know, it's like nobody wants to be that lottery pick. You know what I mean? There's, there's been no hospital, you know, hospitalized the because they're, they're not taking anyone. Even if you was, even if you was on the on the verge of needing hospitalization, your racket be the next best thing to land in a hospital bed. You could be blowing up, vomiting, and having it, and everything else. They're just gonna let you sit there and believe it's just gonna pass over. It should, it should be a bunch of people in here, it's, uh, especially the older guys. You know, there's, there's guys in here in their in their fifties. Whatever, and they're really struggling in there for bed. Like they haven't even got out of bed since this pod pod went on quarantine. I mean, they've been completely rocked by this thing and it's wrong, like throwing up, coughing, uh, like religiously just coughing, coughing, vomiting, diarrhea, all of those types of bed shivering, shaking, and they, they just they just getting in these dudes piling all and telling them to go back in. I think for us, uh, in the unit that I'm in, we, we had no cases, no anything. They brought a whole team here from downtown 
and mix them in and block the people that wasn't in this block. Ever since then, this, the virus has been spreading like wildfire. I'm in the least in the I'm in the dorm with at least. I'm in the dorm with at least sixty, fifty, fifty to sixty people. And I, I think all, I, I think all fifty. I think all fifty people, people for sure have the virus. I, I, I would I would I wouldn't think anything came less. It's just it's based on there's no way for us to social distance. But they've been they've been breaking a lot of the downtown inmates here that that's pre trial. And it's this is this is just ridiculous, man. It's the way they run on this place is it's almost like an animal shelter. <laughs> it's mm. probably no different from an animal shelter. You get one one pair of underwear. You get one pair, one pair one pair of underwear I have to last you the whole weekend. You get one shirt, one like this this shit is just ridiculous. This shit treats people like this regardless of what they what they believe they've done or not done or this is that everybody's not here for the same reason, but we're all being treated the same, which which is like animals. I believe that yeah, they shouldn't be releasing to people. It 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 doesn't the charges the, the charges are yet to be proven. If, if we're going to go with the Constitution and, and we're people, the right to a to, to, to fair and speedy trial, they're not giving the people bail, they're hiding up these charges, the bail that they are giving them are not affordable. So mm-hmm. I, don't, I, I really, really don't, really don't know what they should do. I just know that Something needs to be done, and people definitely deserve an opportunity to, to fight for their health. Not only their health, but their rights and their freedom as well. Well, and I don't believe that it should be done, done in a cage or in these, in these walls. But I think people should have an opportunity to, to do this from home with their family. Well, the first thing is. All right. Thank you all for um, for listening to um, to this individual's testimony. Um, I think one thing to emphasize is um, um, the emphasis on, you know, the amount of pretrial folks inside and the need to start releasing people um, to make social distancing actually possible. Um, I also think it's important to be aware of the immense trauma and pain that this is causing uh, folks, not only folks inside, but their family members. I want to share one more very brief recording um, under a minute, which um, profiles uh, which is a story of one uh, person in RCCC who um, was COVID positive and also happened to have stage four cancer and, and what that experience was like. Okay, we, we had a, a guy here with cancer. Um, the, uh, he fell down and had a stroke one day and he, uh, he, he ate his phone fast. And uh, we had to take care of him and, uh, you know, put him on his uh, rack. We had to wash his laundry for him. And, you know, he was uh, really tired. And sometimes he couldn't get up with child, so we grabbed the tray and take it to his bus. Uh, but it took, uh, after we, uh, after he told the cops that he fell down and had the stroke, it took over uh, four to six hours for them to actually take him to medical. Mm-hmm. So that was the, the one example or one, uh, one time that that happened. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. He did get tested for COVID-19. And uh, that's when they took him out of here and took him to uh, the house, outside hospital because it was, it was uh, having breathing problems. All right. And um, that's all the recordings I have to play for you all today. But um, I think that that last recording was especially um, important because it, it profiled somebody being hospitalized and having uh, major complications. Um, and experiencing major symptoms. And I think in the first one, you also heard the individual share how many people were coughing and, um, and dealing with serious symptoms ongoing from COVID. And so, um, you know, what we've been hearing it, that many cases are asymptomatic and that there hasn't been. Today, we just heard from Dr. Babu who shared earlier that there's been 15 hospitalizations, but that's inconsistent from what we've heard in the past from Dr. Damiano, which is, that there haven't been hospitalizations. So I think that um, there's been an inconsistency in the information that's been shared with the public. Um, and um, with that, I, I wanna kind of pause here and I open it up for folks 
um, back to Liz and for folks to um, public comment. Um, and I just want to like want to finish with um, naming that I, I hear from uh, it, what really concerns me and what I've heard today is that um, the outbreaks and immense outbreaks at um, both of our jails have been almost rationalized um, and made to seem like they're like they've been well managed and under control and in in when unfortunately any outbreak is is actually an emergency. Um, and finally, I really think that I, I really am hearing a lack of, um, of compassion for people who are inside and for their families. Um, and so I, I thank you all for, for listening. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Jael. Um, so I'm just gonna remove your spotlight. Um, if I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> there we go. Um, all right, so we do have a couple minutes and um, what I am gonna ask is for the correctional health team. What was great is that we heard some broad information from our partners at the Sheriff's Department and correctional health, but what Decarcerate is asking about some more specific questions. So that'll be a good opportunity for correctional health to be able to provide a little bit of information before we move into public comment. So hoping to move into public comment about one o'clock. Um, so let me go to you, Sandy. I'll unmute you and then I'll find um, Pamela as well and Dr. Babu. Okay, um, we can answer the question about the hospitalizations. What I was talking about at a prior PHAP call was hospitalizations throughout the pandemic, which has been somewhere between about a dozen or 15 hospitalizations. Uh, during the outbreak, um, I don't want to underplay it, the outbreak was extremely difficult on everyone. Uh, it was difficult on inmates, it's been difficult on family members. We've had numerous calls, both the health staff as well as the sheriff's office on family member calls or friend calls. Um, it's been a huge trial. Uh, the, the large preponderance has been people that are asymptomatic. So that part I wanted to also uh, relay. Uh, so it, it is very difficult and it's been difficult on all the people. Uh, I wanted to also um, ask the sheriff's office to talk a little bit about the cleaning and disinfecting because that came up during part of the call that I could hear. So I don't know if you can unmute um, either uh, the captain, Todd Henry or uh, Paul Belli, Lieutenant. I unmuted all three. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. So Paul, Todd, and Santos, y'all are unmuted. Paul, can you touch on uh, kind of cleaning at the main jail? And then Todd can touch on uh, the cleaning protocols at RCCC. They're basically the same, but again, because of the physical plant makeup, um, you know, they're a little bit different. Go ahead, Todd, or I'm sorry. Paul. Uh, hello, uh, this is Paul Belli. Uh, yeah, I can uh, touch on that. Uh, essentially what we've been uh, doing since the beginning of the pandemic is operating uh, additional cleaning crews. Um, again, much of our workforce is um, inmate, inmate workers, uh, but we also bring in a number of deputies uh, to uh, facilitate all that cleaning as well. So. Each floor uh, at the beginning of this was provided with um, backpack sprayers uh, specifically for uh, either bleach products uh, and or like a Hibistat solution, uh, which is known to uh, be a very good disinfectant. And we instituted um, protocols on each floor that during and after movements uh, of individuals that were suspected uh, of COVID, uh, that there would be a rigorous cleaning process that would occur on that particular floor, floor at that particular time. In addition to that, uh, we ran additional cleaning throughout the facility in between uh, all of those events. Uh, as you can imagine, we have quite a bit of movement within the jail, uh, so that takes a significant uh, undertaking as well. Thank you, Paul. Um, all right, so um, Farla, is it okay if we go ahead and move to public comment? Okay. Yes, please do. All righty, and I'm just gonna go ahead and remute some folks just for background noise. Um, great. 
So we are going to start in public comment. We'll have two minutes. So I'll just put a timer on my phone um, for two minutes. And you can just let me know through, you can raise your hand in video. I will scroll through the videos <laughs> to see if anyone has their physical hand raised. You can also use the raise hand feature. That's easier for me because it moves you closer to my Zoom screen <laughs> and I can see you. You can also send me a comment. So right now I have Aurora, um, Pamela, I have Courtney, a scribe, Maureen. Um, so let me just add those. Maureen, um, T and Sam. So I will just continue to add to that. So we're gonna start with um, Pamela uh, Emmanuel. So let me just find you here on the screen and I will unmute you. All right, Pamela. Good afternoon, everyone. And I wanted to thank you first for letting me speak. I wanted to say I, I have experience from being in Sacramento County Jail for over three years, not too long ago. And what the inmates were saying over the phone is highly true. Um, Chief Ramos, about 10 of us wrote you letters, you and Sheriff, Sheriff Jones letters constantly throughout the three years, you guys never not once replied. You got the letters because we had family members on the outside verify that the letters was received by your office, but you guys simply just didn't re reply. And it's sad, these people are in here are being treated like animals. Uh, each pod has at least 64 people in one pod. You talked about the nurses at Peel Call. Peel Call is simply Peel Call. All they do is issue pills and a lot of times the wrong pill. We were given the wrong uh, medication on several occasions. It's a sick, absolute sick way of, of uh, giving out uh, medication. It's not designed to help the inmate. They do not help the inmates. If the inmate is sick, they do not help you. You hand in a pill call, um, a sick form, which is a call a pink kite. That pink kite is never addressed. You, you can be sick for days, weeks, and you're still waiting. So that part is not true either. There's a lot of false statements going on in this conversation uh, from the nursing staff and from uh, Chief Ramos. None of this stuff exists. You say you have the, the um, consent degree that you follow. You guys don't follow it. We wrote letters to you guys asking, why aren't you following this, this decree that's already a court order in place and nobody is addressing it. Uh, we've asked for, um, I remember I asked one time for out of cell time, which I knew we didn't get at all. We were, we were quarantined for 22 days. And on this paper, it said, I was out of my cell X amount of time. I didn't even come out to use the phone. Pamela, to we're, we're at two minutes time, but I can also add you to the queue again, if you're interested, just so we can make sure. Thank you. I just wanted, I just want to say, please help these people. They need help. Mm -hmm. You know that none of this stuff is true. Please help us. All right. Me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and next we have um, Aurora. So Aurora, here we go. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and start your time. Hi, my name is Aurora Moten, and I have a loved one that's incarcerated. And he's... Oh, Aurora, it seems we lost you. Um, we lost your audio. Um, we can't hear you, or I can't hear you. No. So let me. Aurora, you are muted. So let me just ask you to unmute here and let's try again. Are you able to unmute? Mm, we still can't hear you. So Aurora, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to someone else and then I'm gonna come back to you. So I'm gonna add you to the next person after that, okay? So well, maybe you are able to sign in and sign back out and, and figure out that audio. All right, I'm gonna mute you. Um, okay, so um, next we have Courtney. Um, so Courtney, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and I'm gonna spotlight you. Hello. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. And I, I just want to name that um, I've been doing this type of advocacy around um, jails for literally a decade. 
And the reason I was inspired to do so was because a decade ago, I spent one night in the Sacramento County main jail. And it was so traumatic. And I just refused, told myself, I refuse to live in a county that does this to people. It's not okay. And I just wanna thank PHAB for creating this space. It is much needed. Our jail system was truly in a state of public health crisis prior to the pandemic. And I just wanna share a letter that I received back in May, 2020, because we have been tracing the negligence the entire time. And I can't tell you what it's like to get these phone calls in the middle of the night from people who are panicked with their lives on the line in the hands of people who do not care about them. So at this time, there was public news out that somebody was infected in the jail back in May. And the sheriff's department was claiming publicly this person did not come into contact with anyone. So this is a letter from someone in the main jail. I'm writing this letter so everyone can have an honest outlook of Chief Ramos and Sheriff Jones' lack of the truth. We saw a copy of the SACB newspaper from Friday the 8th. We saw what Sheriff Jones said and posted on his Facebook page and none of his statement is true. In fact, the person who tested positive had contact with inmate workers, her cellmate and some of the deputies. The infected inmate had direct contact with classification deputies. She had direct contact with the pod during her day room time and she touched things in the day room such as the door, metal tables, etc. You can review the cameras to verify. Hopefully- about 15 she seconds left, Courtney. Okay, I'll just skip to the end. How much more should the inmates take? How long should we live in fear? I'm 100% sure Chief Ramos and Sheriff Jones sleep well, warm, and protected at night. Stop putting our lives in danger. We are all scared. We are not safe. We want out of this cruel institution. Your deputies will not treat us like we are human. We truly matter. Long story short, everything we've been hearing inside throughout this entire pandemic directly contradicts what we're hearing from officials. Thank you for making this space. Thank you. Um, okay, so let me just remove spotlight. Um, okay, so next we have Aurora. Um, so let me find you, Aurora, and I'm gonna ask you to unmute. And you should be able to go ahead and start. Still can't hear. There, we can hear you. Aurora, are you? Oh no, we still, we still can't hear you, Aurora. Um, still not able to. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. Um, I might, I might recommend leaving the Zoom room and then coming back in. Sometimes that's helpful for me if I'm having some audio issues, but we're still not able to hear you. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and um, transition to the next person. We have a scribe. Um, so Sonia, um, let me go ahead and unmute you. And so Sonia, you should be able to speak. All right, go ahead. Okay, my name is Sonia Lewis and I am also a member of Decarcerate Sacramento. I wanna highlight three different occasions where um, individuals have come to me um, sharing their experiences with being arrested and taken into um, custody at the um, jail. So in April of 2020, there was a young man who was arrested. There was um, no test offered to him. There was, he was in pretrial, it was a parole violation. He was held until July. He could have been um, released, but he wasn't. There was, this was a nonviolent um, offense. There was no social distancing. There were no masks, no cleaning supplies that were offered. He wasn't released until July, and he, he submitted several kites to staff in regards to care. Let's flip ahead to September. Another young man was arrested and bailed out. During the intake process, he was not offered a test. Um, he was asked about symptoms, but what but still offered no um, testing. Um, there was no social distancing in the mm -hmm. intake process. Um, and he was exposed to several people in the booking tank. Flip ahead to February of 2021, just last month, female was turned herself in for a violation. 
She wasn't offered a test. No masks were given. She was put in a cell with 10 others. Um, when she complained that she was had that she let the, the um, jail staff know that she had um, mental health issues and that she was experiencing an anxiety panic attack, um, a female deputy then snatched her out, physically assaulting her, and then provided her with a mat that another woman was also using. Um, again, no social distancing. No, um, and so I just wanna also lift up that there is a nurse who wanted to keep herself um, um, not expose who she is. Um, she was, she told me that in, from the time that COVID hit back in March till her, um, till she, 10 seconds left, Sonia. Okay, until yeah. she was forced to quit because she was, she contacted COVID inside the jail during work. She then came home and exposed it to her child and her partner and her supervisors in, informed her at the beginning of COVID that this is private um, information and you should not be discussing this with the public. I just want to quickly also lift up the name of Antonio Thomas, who was housed in our, in your facility and in 2019, 19, that there were 10 inmates who um, died in our facilities. That's an average of one death a year. And we know that Antonio was wrongly housed with someone who then murdered him. And so we know that they're not taking the precautions to do what they need to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. All right. So we have um, our next um, person is T. Um, so T, let me... Yeah, I'm not. Oh, here we go. Um, thank you. Yeah, that makes a little. So, I, T, I'm asking you to unmute. Are you able to unmute? Great. Can you say something so we know your audio is working? Oh, I guess my screen. That's awesome. All right, T, you're ready to go. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is T. I live in one of in the county in Sacramento County. Um, and I just wanted to uh, appreciate everyone that spoke before me um, and also highlight the work that I do in the community, um, which is one of those is a uh, jail support. And so a lot of the times um, there's been two different jail supports that I've been involved in since um, the pandemic. If you're able to speak up, people really wanna hear you but are having a hard time. Okay. Um, so since the pandemic, I've been a part of two um, mutual aid uh, jail support, and that's just like a coalition of um, community members um, providing essential services to people who are being released from the jail. Um, and we provide such services as like hot meals, um, warm socks, blankets, um, a way to charge your phone, a call, um, like bus fares, we can't we we have it, um, and um, and things of that nature. Um, and a lot of the times, people who do who come out of the jail, really are kind of left out to dry, and sometimes, um, release in the middle of the night. And so I really don't understand why these. I just, it just doesn't make sense to me, sorry. <laughs> you know, I don't, I'm not trying to rationalize it because it doesn't make sense um, to leave people out who may not be able to have a ride, who do, doesn't have shoelaces. You have about 15 seconds left. Um, and so what I want to wrap up is that, you know, people in there, you know, where's the CARES money going? Because it's not for providing cleaning resources, it's not for providing masses, and it's not for providing uh, sufficient health care um, and timely health care, because even in a consent decree, we're talking about st structural problems, and then we're we're trying to create a solution with a jail annex. So I'm just this doesn't make sense to me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have um, Sam. So Sam, um, I'm going to try to find you here. Oh, there you are. Thanks for waving. <laughs> um, okay. All right, Sam, I've unmuted you. Oh, can I get a volume pack before you start? A, li a little louder would be great. Okay, you got it. <clears throat> yep. All right, you're good to go. Uh, I would like to, I am, my name is Samantha Kramer, also a member of Decarcerate Sacramento. Um, a, I would like to highlight a recent Lan, uh, Lancet Public Health Journal publication 
from this year, February, uh, that very specifically highlights an increase in mortality and morbidity in the communities where there are higher incarceration rates. The study is called Association Between County Jail Incarceration and Cause-Specific County Mortality in the USA, 1987 to 2017. This is one of the few retrospective longitudinal studies that is out there right now. I highly recommend everyone in this call, specifically those with medical backgrounds, please do the read up on this. What this does is highlight <clears throat> how incarceration has negative public health outcomes at the population level for everyone, each and every one of us, whether we are impacted or not, we are impacted individuals in these places where there are higher incarceration rates. So number one thing to do is reduce prison populations. That means shifting funding away we are not investing in prison structures and in annexes and in new ways to uh, incarcerate people. We are investing in new ways to keep people from incarceration. This is the goal. I heard a mention of zero bail. Why, is, why isn't everyone experiencing zero bail? If that is possible for one uh, offense, then it is possible for all offenses. Um, also, I would like to tell a bit of my own story. I come from a, and I come from a policing background. From a very young age, I recognized the inherent racism in members of my family, police members, the language that they use to describe certain skin colors, certain poverty levels, and certain kinds of people that end up in prison. I have an auntie who worked as a nurse in prison and the way that she spoke about the people she was designated to care for mm -hmm. was abhorrent. And when she finally left the prison system, I was relieved for the people that she treated, okay? So we are all Thank impacted you. by this. Reduce prison populations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> So we have um, Sandy Moss. Sandy Moss, it's always helpful if you do have your video on for you to wave or something so I can see where you are. I'm scanning. Oh, oh hi. Thanks, Sandy. Um, okay, um, Sandy, I have unmuted you. Can you yes, speak? Hi. Can you hear me? Great. I uh, can. First, I'd like to thank PHAB for hosting this meeting um, and giving those of us affected a chance to voice our concerns. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, the SAC uh, sheriff staff just painted a picture of COVID conditions in SAC County jails as though it's under control and always has been. And I'm here to say that my loved one who's incarcerated at the RCCC calls me daily with information that powerfully refutes their inaccurate narrative. And from my personal, my very personal connection and view of the inside, I can tell you that the jail staff and sheriff have given a quite an inaccurate and, and actually dangerous and upsetting picture of, of, of what they are claiming is happening. My loved one recounts daily the great human suffering within their entire pod where medical care has not been given and preventative measures have not been followed, which is actually what led to their entire pod becoming infected and ill with COVID uh, due to a person who had a raging fever who was actually just left in the pod um, and subsequently the entire pod was infected, became ill and eventually tested positive. Uh, so there are numerous folks on the inside that had to request multiple times for results, um, written in results. Uh, and I know that someone just mentioned that written results are given as though it's a matter of course, and that's simply not true. Um, Several other requests uh, had to be made in order to finally receive those results in writing. And this is after sending multiple kites of just trying to find out their results. Uh, and I know that folks with very bad body aches had to beg for basic things like Tylenol. It, it's, it's really, really disturbing. Another- About 15 seconds left, Sandy. Okay, um, where do I begin? I just also like to say that uh, that people, there's some long haulers who are very ill still. And to say that uh, uh, that Sac County jails have been spared, which I believe the nursing director Pamela said, shows a real lack of knowledge or a lack of concern and care. And I don't know which is worse, but there's great human suffering in there of real people who have loved ones, families, and friends out here. And those people matter to our communities. So I demand 
their mass release. And I demand you to change your protocols um, yeah. and, and start managing this properly and start showing compassion and, and stop just shoving this narrative that is so false out into the public. Appreciate, appreciate your, your um, comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, so next we have Nikki Jones. Um, Nikki, if you raise your hand, I can see you very easily. I'm trying to find you. There you go. Okay. Oops, I just unmuted the wrong person. Uh, justice to jobs, don't unmute yourself. <laughs> Let me go back to Nikki. All right. Uh, Nikki, can you speak? Yeah. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, firstly, appreciate uh, the Public Health Board for opening space up to talk about this. Um, also, you know, Liz for hopping into what looks like a role that uh, that um, is not maybe your everyday one here at the PHAB. Um, but <clears throat> mostly want to say that I'm, I'm, you know, not at all surprised, but very disappointed in the presentation that um, we just heard from Correctional uh, Health and also from the Sheriff's Department. Um, I think what what I would have liked to have seen, they, they um, very recently had a series of reports um, that connected uh, to a lot of these issues that we're talking about, but um, expert consultants um, who are uh, advising on the consent decree, um, they had report after report, pages and pages and pages of information that has some very real recommendations, some very real gaps that the uh, jail currently has in terms of COVID, but in terms of rights and conditions um, and a culture mm -hmm. of violence that the sheriff's department mm -hmm. um, is responsible for. Um, and so if, 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 Correctional Health and the Sheriff's Department were interested in coming here and having a good faith conversation, having, um, sharing with us, uh, honestly, they, they would have brought some of that information. They would have talked to us honestly about the gaps from the beginning. And as some callers have mentioned, um, what we know is instead they've worked on um, like PR and covering this up mm -hmm. and, and allowing outbreak. Yeah, allowing for continued outbreak um, and suffering within the jail when they could truly just reduce the population. The sheriff has a lot of discretion, a lot of discretion in booking as well. Those people that are released, cited and released within hours, why are those people even coming into the jail? You're putting their lives at risk. You need to drastically reduce the jail population and jail bookings um, as soon as possible. Thank you. Um, so just want to name the queue. We have, um, we're going to go back to Aurora and see if your audio is able to <laughs> um, connect. We have Sonia Brown, Justice to Jobs, Keon Bliss, Christina Bourne, and Pamela Emanuel. Um, so we're going to go to Aurora. Um, trying to find you here. Uh, I'm not seeing you, Aurora. I know you've been popping in and out. So maybe you're not on. Okay, we're going to go to the next person we have here, which is Sonia Brown. Sonia, here we go. Okay, Sonia, I've asked you to unmute. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Hi there. Um, thank you for having me and letting me speak. Um, I have two children that are incarcerated, one at RCCC and one in the Sacramento County Main Jail. They have been in there for six years. Um, and I do want to say that it's horrible conditions. It's horrible that that they are not doing what they're saying that they're doing in this meeting. They're putting it out to uh, make it look like they have everything under control when they're they're doing nothing. I mean, my son is at R Triple C. Um, he did not test positive. He has very severe um, high risk asthma. He has not been separated from, there's at least 20, maybe more uh, positive tests in his barracks, JKF. Um, he has three, as we speak, in his hand. So for them to say there's only five positive to seven positives in there right now is an understatement. That's a lie. There, there's, many, there's many more. Um, he was called to medical. He asked for a mask. They literally told him to borrow a mask. 
from somebody that just tested positive. Um, I went to visit my other son in the county the other day, and there was nothing to clean, nothing to disinfect. I um, had my 15-year-old daughter with me, so I asked for uh, cleaning supplies. I pushed the button, and they never brought it to me. Um, they have people that are uh, workers that are testing positive working in the kitchen still at our triple C that have tested positive. I can say um, it's horrible. It's, it's disgusting to me, you know. Um, you have about 15 they, seconds left, Sonia. Okay, they have workers in there um, that when, they, when they're cleaning up that are working for COVID, uh, cleaning up COVID cells that it should, they should call hazmat or biohazard. They're having them clean feces and blood out of the toilets of COVID inmates that just tested positive instead of calling a hazmat and biohazard. Um, it's just horrible conditions and, and it has to be stopped. There's something has to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so we have just about five minutes left. Farla, did you want to talk about the meeting timeline? Yes, thank you. Um, I don't want to cut people off right now, but I do want to acknowledge all of what we've heard and that there seems more than reason to continue exploring how we can address this issue. And that may mean um, convening a group, uh, a commission, not quite a commission, but some form of group that, rep that includes representation from all the people that we've heard today to further explore these issues and the concerns that the community has and what we can do going forward because um, there is a disconnect right now and we'd like to understand that better. So I, under I know people will have to drop off. I, I urge you to stay with us, but, but please send me um, concerns, you can put comments in the chat, we'll retain that, and uh, I can let you know in some form what we will do going forward, but we will um, meet with these people, meet with the groups that presented today and, and figure out the next step. Thanks, Farla. So just to be clear, you want us to continue the public comment period? Yes, I, I would for, you know, at least who's still in the queue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right, so um, Aurora, I'm gonna go back to you and see if the audio is able to work. So I'm gonna unmute you. Aurora, are you able to speak? I can't, um, I, I clicked ask to unmute. So there should be a button that shows up on your screen. Okay, there we go. We still can't hear you. Still, still unable to hear you Aurora. I'm so sorry for the, for the technical difficulties. Um, I know you've popped in and out multiple times. So you, I'm sure you've tried a number of methods. Um, so we'll, we'll go ahead and transition on to the next person. Um, we have justice to jobs. Um, so let me go. Ahead. Oh, there we go. Okay. Go thank ahead. you so much. Appreciate it, Liz. Um, and PHAB, thank you so much for hosting this. Uh, 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 absolutely needed. I hope it continues. Farla, thank you so much. I just guess, you know, I, I have a lot of concerns, but just to kind of lift up what everyone's saying here today, we heard Matthew say earlier that 40% of, of the people inside the jails are Black. Um, and then when we think about the county personnel not complying with mask wearing, um, and then inside the jail not complying with mask wearing, I think that's consistent with um, recognizing that community has a huge battle to fight and that um, we're not going to get uh, affirmation about that from the personnel inside. I also want to say I'm not just with Justice to Jobs, I'm also with the executive committee with the NAACP. And so this is a huge concern for us. Two things uh, I heard. One is that um, uh, medical access from the person from the person who's incarcerated, their position, it's really not working the way it's supposed to. They're not getting receipts. Kites are taking forever. Um, so what we're hearing from the medical side and from the personnel side is certainly it, there's a there's a total disconnect between what's actually happening. 
um, and what, what the protocol is. And since we already have, have um, we have evidence that protocol doesn't mean anything with mask wearing, I think that we should also draw a conclusion there that protocol is not happening with a lot of other things. And then the other thing is that I, I would like to point out that the consent decree or any other lawsuit is a minimum standard. That shouldn't be the standard. It should be far surpassing those standards. So this is not something um, I, I personally- seconds left. Thanks. I personally be looking into this more. I really appreciate Decarcerate Sacramento uh, putting a spotlight on all of this. It takes a lot of courage to come out. And I'm hoping um, certainly there's no retaliation after all of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I just want to point out two things. One is I was spotlighting people at the beginning, but I couldn't keep up with <laughs> all the Zoom screens. And so I'm no longer spotlighting people, but you may have pin, you can pin people on your screen to, to make them big. I was, I was hoping to spotlight everyone so you could kind of see each public speaker, but I can't keep up. Um, so that that's a thing I changed about a couple minutes into the process. Um, and then Aurora, um, I know that you've had uh, trouble with audio. Don't hesitate to chat me your comment and um, I can take that down. And if you can't chat, it's on your phone. I also sent you a private message with my email address where you can send that information. Um, okay. Um, so the next person we have here is Keon Bliss. Um, so let me, and the queue is Kian Bliss, um, Christina, Born, Robin, and then we have folks that have already spoken once, which is Pamela Emanuel and Sandy Moss. Um, so Liz, perhaps um, after the next two, before the people who have already spoken, mm -hmm. we can go back and hear maybe some input from our previous speakers, uh, Sandy Damiano, and the sheriff uh, mm -hmm. and anyone else. Yeah, so we have uh, three those speakers guys. who haven't spoken yeah. yet, uh, mm -hmm. which is Keon, Christina and Robin. And then of course, we're able to get Aurora <laughs> on. Um, so uh, we, some of the speakers did, the panelists have had to leave Farla. Mm -hmm. um, they have to drop off now. And so that, that may not be possible, but I think we, we can finish out the last few public comments. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to find you, Keon. Um, if okay, there we go. All right, I've asked you to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, you can go ahead and get started. Thank you. Yeah, I uh, really appreciate uh, the speakers from uh, Decarcerate uh, that, uh, that have come on. My name is Keon Bliss, uh, and I'm uh, di constituent district one, um, and I'm just. Uh, wanting to note a couple of things that I heard from uh, the presentation from uh, the uh, correctional health staff as well as the sheriffs uh, about um, uh, where it seemed to be blaming a lot of this stuff on conjugal visits uh, in terms of like how uh, COVID has been transmitted within the jail um, when really I mean uh, according to the uh, the mental health compliance report that's required under uh, the May's consent decree um, the jail population 55% of the jail population has a length of stay of seven days or less, and 95% of the jail population have a length of stay that is six months or less. So um, it, while we have staff that come in and out uh, on a daily basis uh, that uh, in a jail system that has a, a public pro uh, has had a publicized problem uh, with correctional staff, particularly sheriff's deputies uh, uh, on, or sheriff department staff, failing to wear their masks and, uh, and exercise uh, COVID, the COVID CDC mandates uh, properly, um, where even, like to the point where the UC Davis medical staff was reported to have walked out and refused to enter the jail because uh, of jail staff's uh, f failure to comply um, with CDC mandates and COVID protection protocols. So I'm really concerned of how that framing is and blaming, like, try, again, pushing this a lot onto the inmates who are like, who are largely left there and wanting to point out that this is also a huge vector um, for the spread of COVID. Can you have about 15 seconds that. left? So like, we, why aren't we looking uh, at like, why isn't jail staff and correctional health staff looking at how we can keep people out of the jail uh, as opposed to just keeping to bring people in, particularly uh, people that have, like, as uh, Decarcerate has pointed out, ha like, have 
increasing mental health issues that really can't be addressed adequately within the jail, even according to the consent decree, which one of the priority amendments yeah. recommendation said staffing, it was a problem. So just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Um, okay, so next we have Christina Bourne. Um, it is helpful if you re-raise your hand, it brings to the top your name. Um, Christina, there we go. Okay, I, that, <laughs> thank you. So I am unmuting you. Alrighty, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I am, hi all, my name is Dr. Christina Bourne. I'm a local physician um, here in town. I have had the experience of working inside the jail as well. Um, in addition, I have my master's in public health. So making me somebody who is well-versed within our Western medicine literature regarding public health. Um, I first want to thank PHAB um, and Farla for allowing us to um, take part in this meeting. Thanks, Liz, for facilitating. I want to uplift some, some public health facts um, that, that have already been presented, but I wanted to lend perhaps whatever credence or validation behind some things that folks said that racism is actually absolutely a public health issue, that incarceration um, pretty uh, across the board has very little um, positive public health impact um, when in fact um, it is known that you know having, having folks in close quarters, having folks um, be, be close to one another, having folks being incarcerated, um, in, in massive numbers is, is and during a pandemic is absolutely um, asking to spread the virus. Um, we know that there are solutions, including um, decarceration, lowering the numbers um, of those who are incarcerated, especially those who are pre-trial. Um, this, this was news to me and of course not something that's taught to me in medical school and not taught to me in um, my public health training, but, but folks who are who are pre-trial, they, they are essentially guilty um, and being sentenced to a possible death by having COVID. I wanna take a moment and, and talk about my own personal experience working about in the 15, jail with the sheriff's department. I routinely saw sheriffs um, uh, provoke um, those who were in a mental health crisis, um, yelling, making fun of them, using racial, racial slurs. In no way um, is our, our folks getting well in the jail. So we need to allow, we need to invest in our community and decarcerate um, people. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you. Um, and so the last first speaker we have is um, Robin. So Robin, I'm trying to find you here on the screen. Um, are you still with us? So Robin, 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 you yeah. are here. If you uh, use the raise hand function, it, it brings you to the front. Oh, you are here. That's great. Now I just need to find you. Okay, there you go. All right, I'm asking you to unmute. All right, you can go ahead and get started. All right, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna stay off camera because I'm gonna be reading some statements um, from folks who are inside who've shared these thoughts with me. So I just wanted to make these um, to bring these forward um, to be centered kind of with this discussion. So thank you for having this discussion as well. It's greatly appreciated. Um, so first, this first individual said, uh, uh, there's overcrowding in the holding tank. There are 17 or 18 folks in a holding tank despite having an extra holding tank available. Um, they're moving folks from the street and only giving temperature checks and no COVID tests. Um, another individual said they don't give us proper cleaning supplies and some inmates won't have a mask. Some deputies don't wear masks as well. Um, they go on to say no one really knows who is sick or who's not. They place all of our meals on the floor, which is unsanitary. They only give us 15 minutes to shower a day or make a phone call. So it's either one or the other. Uh, we get clean, cleaning supplies from, from deputies or we never get cleaning supplies from deputies. Uh, till this day, I haven't been tested for the virus and was placed around inmates who didn't have it either. Um, another individual says they were here. Um, the, the staff here tell us that there's nothing they can do to protect us from COVID and believe that we're all going to get the virus. We are placed in general population with people that come from the streets without being tested. More and more people have been getting sick. We're placed on lockdown with people uh, test positive, And if you're lucky, you might get Tylenol. I've had the symptoms. I wrote grievances and kites asking for my results to get no response. I still don't know if I had the virus. 
The workers who passed out food do not wear masks and our food is served on the ground uncovered. We don't receive any cleaning supplies for ourselves. Any medical issues or concerns go unseen. Inmates literally have to be close to death to be seen. Two weeks I brushed, um, I brushed my teeth and coughed up blood. I rode a kite to medical, nobody came to check on me. About they got, 15 seconds left. They got so bad I had to kick the door for hours to get an officer's attention. For that officer to tell me there is nothing they could do um, that they're short staff. It's impossible to follow the social distance guidelines. It seems like no one cares. And there's more, but uh, hopefully you're all getting a picture that this is uh, not as clean as, as the county likes to make it out to be. So yeah. thank, thank you. you okay. So Farla, we do have a couple, I just wanna name that there are a couple folks that have asked to speak again. Um, so I'll you know defer to you in terms of the schedule and, and what else you have on the agenda. I want to make sure um, that we have some time, and I, I'd like to take it now to hear um, from Sandy and um, the sheriff's office, um, and if possible, the medical uh, staff. I'm not sure if they're still here, but I, I like some comments, and I'd like to uh, hear from the board also, and mm -hmm. if there are suggestions as to how we can go forward, how we can form a group to um, to, to really take up this issue. Um, I, I did get some messages saying that folks had to head out. Um, I, see, I see Sandy's still on, Dr. Damiano is on and the sheriff is on. So perhaps we could uh, unmute them and uh, hear some comments. Um, I'm trying to find. And I respect that people still want to talk and we can we can stay on and listen after. Uh, this is Sandy Damiano, and I, I'm sorry, I'm needing to leave. I thought we were going to 1.30, so I didn't, wasn't prepared to go over. Um, just a few thoughts. Um, the COVID practices have been in evolution since we began in March of 2020. So we have done several revisions of COVID policies um, over time, uh, which we've had reviewed by our federal monitors. Uh, part of the issue is uh, there is problem with social distancing. I mean, that's very correct because of some of the physical layouts of the jail plants. Um, and I think the sheriff's office can talk more about this, um, but inmates are given masks um, and they are um, asked, they can replace those masks. A lot of times within the housing pods, they will not necessarily wear masks. Um, so that's that uh, piece of information. The other thing with the consent decree, um, uh, as you know, the consent decree was created um, after the plaintiff's counsel was successful in suing um, all the prison system and has been gone in place throughout every county jail. So we're not saying that our jail health standards currently are what they should be. In fact, we would like to, we, we are going to keep improving them. It's a reiterative process, an iterative process. It will take us a period of time to get where we need to be um, in terms of health care and mental health care in the jails. Um, I can't speak so much for the mass releases that people are talking about. Um, obviously for medical staff and for mental health staff, it is easier for us to have a smaller population in the jail and, and we would welcome that. But again, that is not something that we have control over. Our mandate is to treat people that reside in the jails. Uh, and again, I'm really sorry, I'm going to need to get off the call, but I will be speaking with uh, medical and also with the Sheriff's Department uh, about um, this meeting after the call. And I don't know if the Sheriff's Office wants to respond. Is there uh, either Carla, I don't see anyone from the, the Sheriff's we they probably had to leave okay okay so I, sorry no problem i understand um but i i will be in contact um with dr damiano and the sheriff's uh department and um and and possibly um others as well the correctional health to um to form some sort of group whether that be um uh, some investigative task force um, to look into this 
and to address some of the issues that we've been hearing about, which I, I know must be devastating to people who have uh, been in, in jail and to those who are loved ones outside, to make sure that the basic um, at least what we should be doing for COVID is being done. Um, and some of the issues, I, I can't imagine not having masks, people it, it, to make sure that everybody who's serving food have, has masks, to make sure that all of what we expect from COVID prevention and uh, measures to control it are being done and to address other issues. I mean, obviously this is bigger than PHA, but uh, we will make every effort to find a way to, um, to address these concerns that have been raised. And, and Farla, you do have a board member as well that's, that's in the queue. Um, so Phil okay. will ask to unmute. Can, can, can we hear from the board member in case they have to leave as well? Yep, so I just unmuted you, Phil. Hi there, everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Um, I just want to express some gratitude for everybody that's um, spoken so far and very brief for that. Um, the uh, just kind of uh, to echo some of some of Farlow's comments, you know, like these reports from the jail leadership and from the um, community members here are very divergent and like and that's really difficult to reconcile. And I think it is particularly concerning kind of given the asymmetrical power dynamics um, that exist for people who are incarcerated. And um, I just think it, it's really important that we as a board um, really prioritize and amplify the voices of those who have the most vulnerability and the least systemic power in the system um, as advocates for public health. Um, and kind of based on based on what we're hearing, I mean, it, it sounds like there are these policies in place, but when the jail is operating at this population level, um, their ability to follow these best practices for disease control and respond to these medical concerns in a timely fashion um, doesn't really appear possible um, under these current conditions. And, and, you know, our county has the responsibility for the well-being of these uh, people that are incarcerated. Um, and if we're not able to meet these needs, I, I think, you know, it's, it's our, really our responsibility to use every means necessary to decrease the jail population. Um, and so I just want to put that out there. Thank you, Phil. So Farla, we have um, three more public comments, which is great because we do have to um, close things out by two. Um, so the three more public comments we have is we have Pamela Emanuel, we have Sandy Moss, and then Sonia uh, um, from a scribe. Um, so I'm gonna, it, Farla, is it okay if I go ahead and take those last yes, three public do, comments? Yes. Okay, um, all right, so Pamela Emanuel, let me, oh, here we go. Okay, I'm gonna to ask to unmute. Thank you for allowing all me right. to speak again. I wanted to show you guys, yeah. um, this is what the inmates are using to clean and disinfect their cells. This is what we're given to shower with, this little bitty bar of soap. And you have to break a piece off to try to scrub your cell down to disinfect your cell. There's no, there's no way you can possibly social distance in, inside there. The phones, you use the phones, the phones are not disinfected with this or either something they call yellow ball and it's just another form of cleaner. It's not a disinfectant, which they tell everybody it's a disinfectant. It's not, I looked it up when I got out and it's just all lies. I wish they would stop and really listen to the people. And it's good that uh, you know, you're saying that you wanna form some type of committee to do something to, to make a difference. Should you do, maybe you should think about forming it with people who've been in there, people who know what to expect, people who will listen, people will hear you instead of people who don't care. Because it's massive people inside this place that don't care, it's not working. I saw three people die before my eyes that I should have never seen one. You know, I, I you ask for help inside these walls and it's a joke. I can, I, I've said it several times, I have a list of names I'll be more than happy to drop to give to to Mr. Ramos 
and Sheriff Jones if they if they would want to listen. But trying to get them to listen to the other side is almost impossible. And I think today is a day that they really need to start because it's not fair to people to fear their life. They're fighting a case. They shouldn't have to fear their life too. It's not right. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Um, okay, and we have Sandy Moss. Um, so Sandy, I'm just trying to find you here on the screen. Hey, I unmuted. Okay, okay great. Sure, I, yeah, I don't know how, that. but I did. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so I just yeah. wanted to address a couple things. I know from that I didn't get a chance to initially, but I know from communicating with my loved one that some folks are still experiencing uh, concerning symptoms, um, even though they are out of quarantine. And these are the folks who were ill with uh, COVID. Um, and what we know about this disease is that for some people called long haulers, the effects of COVID can be long lasting. Uh, they can have severe uh, severe symptoms like memory loss, brain fog, uh, con continuous fatigue, and it, it just goes on. And it's very upsetting because uh, for the sheriff's staff uh, and jail staff to have acted with such negligence towards those who could not protect themselves from COVID and seem to honestly have, have been almost willfully infected by something that has uh, the possibility of hurting them long-term like this is unconscionable. And we're not even talking about people who haven't been convicted of anything, people who are pre-trial. I just, I cannot believe the cruelty. Um, and as you can imagine, the mental health effects due to this mistreatment um, it, and, and being kind of made to feel like they don't matter um, is just very, very damaging. Um, and that has nothing to do with a, a shiny facility with lots of space. Um, that has everything to do with the treatment and the negligence and the lack of care and the lack of concern. And I'd like to also mention that it keeps being mentioned that uh, the most of the people who test positive are largely asymptomatic. Well, that's not at all what I'm hearing from the inside. Um, uh, from my loved one who was ill with COVID and in a in a quarantine. We have about 15 bar. seconds left. And the fact that that keeps getting brought up and pushed as a narrative belies a dangerous and extremely uncompassionate viewpoint. And even if it were true, um, does it mean that the 10 people out of a pot of 50, that's 20% that are vomiting, have raging fevers and can't get out of their racks due to fatigue and body aches don't matter? I mean, it, those 10 people, they just don't matter. Uh, yeah, I, I think there has to be a shift in uh, in the way that they, they treat these folks. And, and Thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks. You. Okay. Thanks. Um, and then we have our last public comment here. Um, Sonia from Ascribe, I'm going to unmute you. Okay. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak again. I um, wanted to really go back to the point of um, staff members, nursing staff, medical staff in particular, um, being instructed by their supervisors to not have a con not have conversations with the outside world um, about what's going on on the inside. The the fear factor for people who are working in these in positions that don't have that are not positions of power um, is a matter of fear. It's a matter of fear to their livelihood and their ability to take care of themselves and their families, because if they lose their jobs, they can't, they'll, you know, they fall into that group of people in our county and across this country experiencing the uh, impact of COVID. And so we really and truly have to look at beyond the fact that sheriff deputies um, are being extremely violent and non-responsive to individuals who are not getting, who are having symptoms and may be experiencing mental health issues or other um, um, medical issues. So they're they're negligent on, on multiple levels, right? We also need to make sure that we understand that inmates who are there, housed there, are experiencing retaliation and non-responsive deputies is a part of retaliation. When you don't show up for someone who is experiencing a medical health or a mental health crisis and you don't show up and then allow them to potentially get sicker and sicker and or die like Antonio Thomas or Brian Debs who died in our facilities, right? And there are countless others. When we do that, that's negligence. And when the negligence happens, that means the taxpayers, all of us, are paying that cost when lawsuits happen. And so we're paying- 
we're paying for bad behavior. And I cannot just, my last point that I wanted to say is that we cannot give the sheriff department a pat on the back from reducing the inmate population from approximately 3,700 is what I heard to approximately 3,100. I'm not a mathematician, but you do the math and tell me what that, per, that percentage reduction is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, Carla, I'll turn it back to you to um, closing remarks. Thank you very much. And again, I, I so appreciate everybody coming and offering comment, public comment here. Um, we really need to understand what's going on. This helps us. And it is my absolute intention to pr proceed in finding a way to bring together these parties and addressing these issues to make sure that the conditions in the jail are what they should be for human respect and health. And um, we, will, we will be letting the public know how that will look, what, what that will look like and um, inviting comment there too. So again, I, I so appreciate everybody's involvement here. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop